Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about price controls. First one we're going to start with is a price ceiling, which is an artificial maximum price. Uh, followed by we're going to talk about a price floor, which is an artificial minimum price. Let's begin with the uh, price ceiling. Maximum price meaning that government imposes a legal maximum price that sellers can charge to buyers. So you might think of it as an interference in the ordinary supply and demand equilibrium price, which was $5 at a quantity of $100. What is the distorting effect of a price control if we impose a price ceiling of say $4 per gallon? Well, first thing we're gonna do is let's line this price up to our supply and demand curve. Let's just, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we'll say it's now illegal to charge a price that is above that $4 threshold. It's still legal to charge below, so this is all legal. But anything above $4, we are now making it illegal to, uh, to, to sell it. So what is that going to do? Well, let's follow. Where does $4 intersect with the quantity supply? Okay, the law of supply basically says that at high prices, suppliers will supply more, and at low prices, suppliers will supply less. So at the lower price, when we drop that price from $5 to $4, what we do is we reduce the quantity supplied, which was 100, down to four, uh, down to 90 units. So an easy way to do this is just follow that price and see where does that intersect with the uh, with the quantity. Where does that price intersect with your new quantity in the supply curve? That is the quantity supply. So where does the price of four dollars intersect? with the supply curve, and it's at the quantity of 90. Where does the price intersect with the demand curve? And that is at the quantity of 110. So remember that the law of demand says that at low prices, people will want to buy more, and at higher prices, people will want to buy less. So this follows the law of demand, which states that the quantity demanded will be greater as you lower the price. Now, of course, this is an artificial lowering of a price. So, <clears throat> a nice trick to remember what is a price ceiling is that, you know, you remember that you want supply and demand to be at equilibrium. So you might think of it as you've got supply and demand that long to be at equilibrium, but they can't get to equilibrium. Why? Because they're hitting their heads on the ceiling, and it's illegal to get above the ceiling. So it's illegal to be below, but it's illegal to be above that artificial ceiling, right? So we have a disequilibrium because we're stuck here where we really want to be up here, back at that market equilibrium. Okay, so now that we know we have a quantity supply of 90 and a quantity demanded of 110, we know that we have what we call a shortage. And that shortage is in the amount of 20 units, meaning that there are 110 units demanded, but only 90 supplied. Therefore, there's not enough being supplied to meet that demand, and at this price we have the shortage. So because we have this shortage, you might think of the, the, the number of transactions as being 90. So what is that going to do? It's really going to cut everything to the right side of the graph off. So everything to the right of 90 becomes what you might think of as potential, meaning that all of those people are you know, willing to buy at those prices or willing to, to sell at those prices. Everything to the right, the supply and the demand, they're willing to buy or sell at particular prices. In this case, you know, maybe a supplier is willing to supply at six, but nobody's willing to buy. Maybe a buyer is willing to buy at, I don't know, maybe they're willing to buy at 450, but it's illegal for them to buy at that price. And so these people all become what we might think of as potential demanders. And, suppliers. But everything to the left side of the graph is what you might think of as actual. Okay, so that's still happening. This is not happening, this is happening. Okay, so how is that going to affect the surplus areas? Okay, so uh, kind of going uh, uh, to the next step, we want to look at the area of consumer surplus and producer surplus and how is that affected. So I'm going to use letters, area A, B, to denote the original consumer surplus and area C, D, and E to denote 
the original producer surplus. Now, that's originally before the price control. So what's going to happen first to areas B and D because it gets cut off? But well, people are not allowed to buy up here. And so these transactions become what we call dead weight loss. That is unrealized gains. So these are people who are willing to buy and sell at those particular prices, but they're not allowed to. So that's area B and D is your dead weight loss. What else occurs with this graph? Well, if you remember that the that the consumer surplus is everything above the price, kind of inside of the demand curve, and producer surplus is everything below the price inside of the supply curve, we can see that that makes sense, well, that the consumer surplus was above, producer surplus was below. Well, what happens when you drop that price? Area C is now above the price, which means that area C gets captured by the consumer surplus or transfer. So area C and A are the new consumer surplus and all that's left of producer surplus is this little small area below the price which is area E. So one way to think of this is that you know there you had a particular supplier that was perhaps willing to supply gas at three dollars and they used to be able to sell it at five which meant they had a two dollar producer surplus but now they're only willing to, or able to sell that at four, which means they only have a $1 producer surplus. That's why it was reduced. On the flip side, the consumer, let's say this particular consumer, maybe they were willing to pay up to $7 for gas, but they only had to pay five. Therefore, they had a $2 consumer surplus. That's the difference between what they're willing to pay and what they actually pay. And now, because the price has been artificially lowered, that consumer who is willing to pay $7 is now only paying four dollars thus they have a dollar increase in their consumer surplus now that leaves aside you know that say oh well good well consumers are getting lower prices that's good and you know it's at the expense of the producers that doesn't quite tell the whole story because this has a distorting effect right so we have decreased the quantity supplied and increased the quantity demanded so there's 20 units that are not being supplied or perhaps 20 people that are waiting to get gas that can't get it and so that's part of the negative effect of a price control is that it distorts prices, sends a bad signal to suppliers that tells them to supply less, and it sends a bad signal or the wrong signal to, to, to consumers that says that they should buy more. Thus, you have that gap between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. Thus, this concludes the basics of a supply and demand graph with a price control. Now one thing that is often done is you may be asked to calculate the areas of surplus, in particular maybe the area of the deadweight loss. So a real simple easy way to understand this is that you're looking for the area of B and D. So the area of this deadweight loss triangle. So if the height of the triangle is $2 and the width of the triangle is 10, you're going to do 2 times 10. $2 times 10 equals 20, but then you have to divide it by 2, which gives you 10. So the deadweight loss area is $10, if you're asked to calculate that. That concludes the price control for price ceiling. Now what we want to talk about is what is called a price floor. A price floor is another type of price control, but in this case, we're not talking about an artificial maximum price, we're talking about an artificial minimum price, meaning you can't charge below this particular price. The most common types of price floors are price controls on wages, or what we call minimum wage laws. So what we're going to do is demonstrate a minimum wage um, uh, a law that is imposed on a market that has an equilibrium wage of, say, $8 per hour, in an equilibrium quantity of 100 units. Now we want to remember that in this case this is a resource market which means that the suppliers are the households or the workers. Okay? So we're not talking about the demand for jobs, we're talking about the supply of workers. The demand comes from firms who demand the workers. Okay? So it's a slightly different uh, way of looking at uh, uh, supply and demand that often confuses students, so you just want to remember that the supply is the workers, the demand 
is for the workers from the firms who are hiring. So let us suppose that the government says we're going to put a minimum wage of $10 an hour in place so that workers get more money and you know their living wage and all these other things. So what is that going to do? Well, at this $10 per hour minimum wage, it is now illegal for you to charge less than $10 an hour for your labor services, but it's still legal anything above $10 per hour. You might think of it this way, that it is now illegal to go below the floor and it, you know, you're standing on the floor, you want to get below it, but you can't. Perhaps the workers don't want to get below it, but perhaps people are trying to hire workers at lower rates, but it is now illegal. Okay, so it's legal to be on the floor, but you're illegal if you go below the floor. Where does this price of $10 per hour intersect with the demand curve? Okay, so we're going to follow this price all the way over to where does it hit the demand curve? Okay, well, what quantity is that? Well, it's going to be at approximately 80 units. That is the quantity demanded. Now, where does that price intersect with the supply curve? It's going to be approximately at 120. Okay, so we now have this large gap between the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied. Okay, so all that we're doing to get these numbers here, the, the, the 120 and the 80, is we are following where does this price hit the demand curve? That is your quantity demanded. Where or at what quantity does that price hit the supply curve? That gives you your quantity supplied. So that's how we come up with this. So now that we have a quantity demanded of 80 and a quantity supplied of 120, we now have what we call a surplus. What does that mean? It means that there are more workers willing to work than uh, firms willing to hire. So the surplus is in the amount of 80. It's the difference between, one, or I'm sorry, 40, the difference between 120 and 80. Now, the next thing that we may want to consider is how does this affect the consumer and producer surplus? So the original consumer surplus was area A, B, and C, right? So all the blue area. So area A, B, C before the price control, and area D and E were the producer surplus. All those green areas, that was the producer and consumer surplus. How does this price control affect the consumer and producer surplus? So the first thing that's going to happen is we basically cut off some of this right side, right? Because now the number of transactions that are going to occur, you have to have a supplier and a demander in order to have a transaction. You have to have a buyer and a seller. So in this case, you've got uh, 120 sellers of labor, but only 80 buyers. So everything to the right of 80 gets cut off. Okay, so you might think of this as potential. Potential market, but it's not happening because the price control is basically distorting people's willingness to buy or sell labor. Everything to the left of 80 is still happening. So that's actual. Okay, that's actually occurring. So you might put like a check mark there. So everything to the right gets cut off. So that means that area C and E get cut off and become dead weight loss. So C plus E are now unrealized gains. They're buyers and sellers of labor that would be willing to transact and have a uh, you know, an agreement to work under lower labor cost conditions, but because, you know, we know that as the price rises, the quantity demanded decreases because buyers buy less, in this case, they're the, the firms that are buying less labor, and as the price rises, the supply is going to increase, or the quantity supply, which means that suppliers of labor are going to increase their quantity supply. They're going to be more willing to work, and so we have this big gap. So the result is that we now have this deadweight loss of people who are willing to work and perhaps willing to hire at lower prices, but with this higher minimum wage, they're not willing to. What else occurs? 
Well, if you remember that consumer surplus is going to be everything above the price, producer surplus is everything that's below the price that's inside of the supply curve and inside of the demand curve. When you raise that price up, area B is now below the price, which means that that actually gets captured by the producers. In this case, that's the workers, right? Because the supply is the workers. And so what this represents is some of the workers who perhaps were willing to work at, say, lower wages, but they were going to get the market wage, which was eight. And so, you know, let's take, for example, a person that was willing to work at five, that's producer surplus, is the idea that you're willing to work at, uh, you're willing to supply at a certain price, but what do I actually get? Maybe it's more. So that's the surplus. So this person is willing to work at five. They used to get eight, so they're happy because they're getting an extra $3. But now they're not just going to get an extra $3, they're going to get an extra $5. They're going to have this gain of $2 to their wages. So this represents the $2 wage gain for these first 80 workers. Okay, This area B is going to be transferred to the workers who actually get jobs. $2 times 80 workers. They're very, very happy about this. So the area of producer surplus is now D and B. Consumer surplus is only going to be area A, just the small area that is above the price. Now, one thing that we are not talking about is because of this price control, there's a decrease in the quantity supplied, increase in the quantity demanded, or I'm sorry, there's a decrease in the quantity demanded, and there's an increase in the quantity supplied of workers. So what that means is that we have a surplus of workers of, who are now unemployed. They're looking for work, but they can't. And worse yet, some of these people are actually going to perhaps get laid off. Why? Because the, the, the employer says, gosh, you know, I would hire more workers at lower wages, but at these higher wages, I'm not going to be able to hire, say, 100 workers, but only 80 workers. And so some people end up perhaps losing their jobs. Last thing that you may want to consider is how do you calculate the area of deadweight loss? In this particular case, you have a $4 high deadweight loss. So it's from approximately $6 to $10. So $4 times the width, which in this case is 20, that's going to give you 80. But you have to multiply. But you have to divide it by two. So that means that you have a forty-dollar deadweight loss if you're looking for the area. And this concludes the basic price floor price control graph.